It is good to see everyone here tonight. We are uh, starting with our uh, short Bible class time that we call Soldiers of Christ. Uh, and uh, we spend a few minutes in, uh, in an uh, interactive, uh, intergenerational kind of Bible class uh, for a few minutes. And then uh, we go right into our evening worship. And so uh, we've been doing this for about uh, three weeks now and seems to be, seems to be working. And uh, it'll take a while to get used to it. And then probably once we get used to it, we'll uh, do something different. Uh, but uh, we're, we're glad that you're here tonight. Soldiers of Christ is uh, designed to help us to get into the Bible, to learn the Bible, to write it upon our hearts and to become better followers of Jesus. And so we're just spending a little bit of time each night doing that. And right now we're in the New Testament. We're going through the life of Jesus. And uh, honestly, we're probably going to be in the life of Jesus for the next few years. So uh, if you don't like studying about the life of Jesus, well, you've got bigger problems than being here for Soldiers of Christ on Sunday nights. Uh, but uh, we're, we're going to spend some time just looking at various events. Uh, what we did in his kids tonight, which, uh, um, which none of you are a part of unless you're little kids, but what we're doing in his kids is we are learning the Soldiers of Christ Bible facts. Uh, and so if you've got kids that are in his kids, then you need to make sure you've got a copy of the cards uh, that we have for Soldiers of Christ. And uh, we are going through the uh, overview of the Bible cards in his kids. And uh, they are all getting their own dog tags that say their name on them and say a soldier at PBL Church of Christ on them with their name. And as they learn each card, they're going to get a dog tag uh, to add to that that has a different color uh, based upon what they're learning. So if your kids aren't here at uh, 530 for his kids, uh, get them here, uh, get a copy of the cards of Soldiers of Christ and uh, help them to learn those so that when they come to class, they can answer the questions, they can get the dog tag, and uh, hopefully they enjoy learning the Bible. So, tonight, we're going to sort of finish up uh, talking about John the Baptist, and we're entering into material that we have not covered yet. Everything the last couple of weeks has been kind of review of what, we've, uh, of what we've already covered earlier in the year on Soldiers of Christ, but we're going to talk about some new stuff uh, on John the Baptist tonight, but just as a way of reminder on where we are in Soldiers of Christ, what are we trying to do? We're trying to learn the truth about the life of Jesus because that's the whole theme of the Bible. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, we keep saying that, but we keep saying that because it needs to get into our heads. What's the Bible all about? Jesus Christ. That's what it is. What's the book of Genesis? What's the book of Exodus about? Jesus Christ. And so as you read through the Bible, you've got to find Jesus on every single page because that's what it's all about. When you're going through and listening to Richard's class on Exodus and Leviticus, and he's telling you about all of these sacrifices that they made in the book of Leviticus, what's that all about? It's about Jesus Christ. You've got to figure that out. Uh, so, David, what's it about? See, I mean, he's got it, all right? So if he's got it, we've got to get it. So, John the Baptist. John the Baptist. What was the work of John the Baptist? Open book test, freebies. What was the work of John the Baptist? He was the forerunner of Christ. What's a forerunner supposed to do? He's to prepare the way of Jesus. This guy's got his stuff lined up, so he's preparing the way of Jesus. He comes along and is getting everybody ready for the coming of the Messiah. Now, we talked about him last week. We talked about what he did in his preaching. We talked about him in baptizing people. But I want you to turn your Bibles, get your Bibles out, go to Matthew 11, Matthew 14. You get those kind of back to back there, okay? Matthew 11, Matthew 14. So, John the Baptist. Here is the man who is uh, coming along and preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here's the man who's baptizing people. Why did he baptize people? What was the purpose of his baptism? For forgiveness, for the remission of sins. That's what it was all about. He's baptizing people so they can have the remission of sins. Why are people to be baptized today? What's the purpose of baptism today? For the remission of sins. God didn't change that. Wouldn't that have been confusing if God had changed it? What if God gave one purpose to John's baptism and then turns around the Great Commission, oh, let me come up with a different purpose. Aren't you glad that God kept it consistent all the way through? All right, so Matthew chapter 11 where is John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11? Good. Now we get to read it because uh, you didn't answer it. Where is John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11? He is in prison. Is prison a good place to be? 
Not, Marion says not. All right? Prison is not a good place to be. All right? David, we got that one? Prison is not a good place to be. Lucas, we got that? Prison is not a good place to be. John the Baptist is in prison. Um, we'll get to this in a little while when we get to chapter 14, but why is he in prison? You remember why he was in prison? What bad, horrible thing did he do? He told Herod that he didn't have a right to be married. Uh oh, that'll get you thrown in prison. All right, we'll get to that when we get to chapter 14. So, John the Baptist is in prison. And what does John the Baptist do while he is in prison? He sends, the messengers, he sends messengers to Jesus. And what do they ask Jesus in verse 3? Are you the coming one? Or are we supposed to look for somebody else? You know, all sorts of people have tried to figure out, what was, why was John asking that question? All sorts of people have looked into verse 3 and say, they're kind of scratching their heads about, he's John the Baptist. Why would he be asking, are you the coming one or should we wait for another? Why would John the Baptist, so some people, and, and, and this, this may be what, you know, the re, we're not really told everything about what was going on, the exact, so sometimes it's been surmised, well, maybe he was asking the question for the benefit of the people that he sent to ask the question. Maybe he wanted them to hear the answer, but he already knew the answer. Is that a possibility? Sure. That's a possibility. Why is it that we so readily and immediately just want to push aside the question of maybe John really wanted to know the answer to that question? Would it bother you if John really wanted to know the answer to that question? Would it bother you if John's faith was a little questioning, wavering, wondering? Would that bother you? Was John the Baptist a superhuman? Was John the Baptist, was he immune to things that we deal with? Was John the Baptist immune to doubts? Do you ever have doubts? Have you ever doubted that there really is a God? Have you ever doubted that the Bible is from God? Have you ever doubted that Jesus really is the Son of God? You ever doubted that? Now, is there any evidence to prove it? Is there any evidence to prove there is a God? The heavens declare the glory of God. I was going to say there's mountains of evidence, but if you say there's mountains of evidence to prove there is a God, you have to say there's valleys of evidence, and there's trees of evidence, and there's skies, and there's, and there's sun and moon and stars of evidence. There's tons of evidence. Any evidence the Bible is from God? Do you have any evidence of that? You know the people who are the most readily... The, the, do you know the people who jump on board and they shout the loudest that the Bible is not from God? Do you know what kind of people those are? Most of them are people who have never read the Bible. do not you th think about that? The people who are shouting the loudest, no, the Bible isn't from God, most of them have never actually read it. Isn't that interesting? How can they make a claim about something they've never read for themselves? But what happens when you get in and read it? Do you find things in the Bible that shouldn't be there if John and Willie and Richard and Ivan were sitting down and writing it? You find stuff in there that shouldn't be there if those guys were sitting down and writing it? One of the questions on the card is, how many men wrote the Bible? Good, 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 good. All right, now that you've had time to think about the question. About how many men wrote the Bible? Oh, okay, see, David's got to help us here. So about 40 men write the Bible. Over how long of a period did they write this? 1,600 years. Did they, know, did they know each other? Were they buddies? Did they live with each other? No. They're living in completely different areas, different continents, different countries, different cultures, different times, 40 different guys. And when they write the Bible, do they ever contradict each other? Do they ever say, oh, yeah, but that's old school. You know, Joshua, that was way back in the day. We know better now. Any of that going on? No. They all stay on point. They all stay on theme. What's the theme of the whole Bible? Jesus Christ. And they're all on it. They're all on it. 
So, is there evidence in the Bible? Yeah, so you go through, John perhaps here is having doubts. If you just got thrown in prison, would you be thinking about things? Would, would, would you be mulling things over in your head? I'm here in prison. I mean, that's, you got a lot of time to think, apparently, when you're in prison. Are you the one, or do we look for another? So here's the deal. Jesus says in verse 4, Go and tell John the things that you hear and see. I thought about bringing, thought about bringing the kids up here and, uh, and having them help us out, but I decided not to. But I want you to think about this. What, 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 is, what, what did they see and hear? Verse 5, what did they see and hear? Number one, the blind see. Stop for a second. The blind people, the blind people could do what? They could see. Is that a miracle? I mean, some, some, of, you, some of you wear glasses, wear contacts, right? Some of you had cataract surgery, right, so that you could see a little bit better. Um, any of those miracles? No, you wish it'd be a miracle so that you'd have 20-20 vision without any of that stuff you needed. Miracles when the blind people who were born that way could see. Go back and tell John. Go back and tell John. The blind people can see now. What about the lame people? What can they do now? What do you mean? People who've never walked before can get up and walk? Who, who can do that? Who can do that kind of thing? What about the lepers? What happened to them? They're healed. Go back and tell John that you saw some lepers cleansed. Who can do that? Can just anybody do that? What about the deaf people? They could hear. They could hear. Go back and tell John what you've seen, what you've heard. What about dead people? What's happened to them? They've been raised from the dead. What about the poor people? This one kind of throws you off maybe a little bit. What about the poor people? This guy knows the Bible. The gospel's been preached to them. Why is that a big deal? Because who preaches to the poor? Who gives any attention to the poor? What can they do for us? You know who you preach to? You preach to the people who can give you money. If you don't believe that, turn on the television. Watch your televangelist. What are they doing? They're preaching. What are they asking for? Money. So, why are they preaching to the poor? The poor can't do anything for them. That's not the point. They get the good news like everybody else does. Six things that Jesus says, go back. Now, was Jesus just making these things up off the top of his head? Was he just like, eh, let's see, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. Do you all have any, uh, in your Bible, do you have any footnotes for verse 5? Do you have any footnotes that take you to another book of the Bible? Go over to Isaiah 35, Old Testament. What is Isaiah known as? He's not the weeping prophet. prophet. What is Isaiah known as? The messianic prophet. He's the prophet who was writing about the Messiah, and, and not, that, not that the others were not. The other prophets were writing about the Messiah as well, but, but uh, Isaiah is just... Is, uh, is packed with truths about the Messiah. What does he say? Look in Isaiah chapter 35. Um, go to verse 5, real quick. Isaiah 35, verse 5. The eyes of the blind shall be open. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer. The tongues of the dumb shall sing. The water shall burst forth in the wilderness. When Jesus is telling John's disciples what to go and tell him, was Jesus just making stuff up? What's the point? Well, point number one is, how can all of these things happen? How can the deaf hear, the blind see? How can the lame walk? How, that can only be done by God, number one. Those are miracles that can only be done by God. But number two, what was Jesus actually doing with these guys? He's quoting Scripture. He's quoting prophecy. So not only is Jesus doing acts that only God could do, he is doing things that were prophesied about the Messiah. What does that prove? John says, are you the one, or do we wait for another? And what does Jesus say? Nobody else can do this. 
Was Jesus... Have, have you heard people preach their opinions before? Here's what I think about this. Here's, here's what I believe about this. These weren't opinions. These were factually based truths. John was having doubts. What did he need? Factually based truths. When you start having doubts, when you have doubts about God, about the Bible, about Jesus, don't go on the internet and look stuff up. Guess what the internet's going to do for you? It's going to feed your doubts. You're going to find all sorts of people out there. You're going to find, I almost mentioned the website and I'm not going to. You're going to find all sorts of people out there that are going to tell you all sorts of reasons not to believe. Guess what their opinions are not based upon? Factually based truths. You have doubts? Where do you need to go? Not the internet. Go to the Bible. But go to the Bible and put it to the test. Can I trust this book? And guess what you're going to find every time you put this book to the test? You can trust every bit of it. John the Baptist, are you really the one? You really the one? Jesus says, quote these verses, you know what, I've, what you've seen and heard, go back and tell John. What do you think that did for John's faith? Okay. That's what I wanted to hear. Now, when they leave, John start, Jesus starts talking about John behind his back. Is that a nice thing to do, talk about somebody behind their back? Don't you, did your mom ever tell you? Don't you talk, that's mean, that's rude. You don't talk about somebody behind their back. Jesus is talking about John behind his back, and it's not fair because he's not there to defend himself, right? I mean, if you're going to talk about somebody behind their back, make it somebody that's in prison, right? They can't come into Wrong. Why is he talking about John behind his back? Is he saying bad things? What'd you go out to see? Some reed shaking in the wind? Some guy that was vacillating? What'd you go out to see? He talks about him as a prophet. And what does he say about John? What does he say about John as one who was born among women? Was there anybody greater? No greater prophet than John. That's saying a lot. Jesus, talking about John behind his back, yep, but what's he doing? Picking him up and elevating him, saying he's the greatest prophet that there's been. If you're going to talk about somebody behind their back, that's the only way you get to talk about them. You've got to build them up and make them great. Last thing I want us to see in Matthew 11 before we go to chapter 14. But what did Jesus say, who's greater than John the Baptist? If John the Baptist is the greatest among the prophets, I mean, you can't beat that, right? I mean, verse, what is that, verse 11? Of those born of women, there is not one risen one greater than John the Baptist. You can't beat John the Baptist. Guess what? Hello? Guess what? What does he say at the end of verse 11? But... He who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. That's all of us. What does that mean? Guess what John did not get to be a part of? The kingdom. He didn't get to be a part of the church. He didn't get to be a part of the kingdom. He did all of this great work in, in preparing the way for Jesus, and yet he didn't get to be a part of God's eternal plan. Some people want to say, oh, the church isn't that big of a deal. Well, it was a part of God's eternal plan. All oh, the church, I can live without the church. Jesus died for the church. If he died for it, how can you live without it? Can't happen. John didn't get to be a part of the church. We get to be a part of it. Jesus says, here's the great John the Baptist, and you can be even greater in the eyes of God because you get to be a part of his church. Go over to chapter 14. All right, chapter 14, John's... Actually, in chapter 14, John's not in prison anymore. Uh, chronologically, he's not in prison anymore. But we're being told about when John was in prison. And we're being told about when John was in prison because Herod Antipas thought that Jesus must have been John raised from the dead because of what, uh, what was happening. But obviously, he was not. But uh, Herod had been responsible for killing Jesus. Now, so, back to that question we asked a little while ago. Why was John the Baptist in prison? How did he end up there? Yeah, look in chapter 14, verse 3. Herod, this is Antipas, son of Herod the Great, laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison. Why? For the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Oh, that sounds kind of innocent. 
right? So he's put in prison because of Herodias, who was Antipas's brother Philip's wife. That, that's, that's not bad, right? You're just put in prison for somebody, somebody else's wife, right? No. You take this and you compare it with Mark's account. Mark's account goes on to say, for his brother Philip's wife, whom Herod had married. Oh. So he took... Is, you, you think you have problems in your family? He took his brother Philip's wife. Hmm. Pretty serious problems, right? So what does John come along and say in verse 4? It is not lawful for you to have her. And the Bible indicates it's not just that he preached this one time. It's not just that he walked up to Herod and tapped him on the shoulder one day and whispered in his ear, Hey, Herod, you're not allowed to have her. The Bible indicates he kept saying it. He kept saying it. If somebody kept telling you that you were in sin, would that bother you? He kept saying it. Is it easy to tell somebody that they're not right with God? Not easy. He kept saying it. Until finally, the king says, you know what? I'm the king and you're not. I can do something about this. And throws him in prison. Throws him in prison because he was telling him what he needed to hear. What ends up happening to John? He loses his head. He dies because of what he was preaching. I wonder, do we have that kind of conviction? To tell people what they need to hear, even if they don't want to hear it. Regardless even of what the consequences might be. It's not likely that we would lose our head, but could we lose a friendship? Could we lose a job? Could we lose something else? Is it worth it? Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Sometimes the gospel means that people have got to make some serious changes in their life. And it's our job to help them to see that. John the Baptist, an incredible Bible character. A lot of lessons for us to learn. If you're one of the men who's leading us in worship tonight, I'm going to lead us in a prayer just briefly uh, in just a moment. But if you're on the stage and leading a prayer, leading singing, if you all want to come on up um, and, uh, and be ready. Uh, to, uh, to uh, lead us in our worship tonight. Thank you all for being a part uh, of this class tonight. Again, if your kids are not here for his kids at 5.30, I would encourage them to be here. We will not be having his kids ne class next week. Here we are pushing his kids. We're not going to have class next week, but uh, make sure you've got the questions for them to learn so that they can uh, be ready for his kids and be getting the dog tags uh, and, to, uh, and to be a part of that. So that's, uh, that's a brief overview of, uh, of, of one part of the life of Jesus and our Soldiers of Christ study, and uh, we will pick up, uh, pick up with more uh, next time. Let's, let's pray, and let's get ready to worship our God.